Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Thurger and today I'm going to answer a question, this time not by one of my patrons, but a question I found to be pretty interesting actually uh, in the comment section of one of my videos. I was actually replying to that comment um, until I realized that my comment had to actually be divided into five different comments. And obviously, I can't possibly uh, just spam like that. <laughs> so, I'm going to answer a question uh, concerning loke and eating a heart, which is often perceived to be the heart of Gurveig. On my latest video, uh, precisely concerning Gurveig, which you can see right here, I have received a comment which, you know, as I said, I found very interesting and uh, I would like to share with all of you, um, share with you my thoughts on the matter. And I take the opportunity to tell you that, uh, well, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm just one person with actual human physical limitations. So I can't answer all of you. It's just impossible, as you might imagine. Not to mention that I have um, little free time on my hands, which I often use precisely to create uh, YouTube videos, YouTube content, and content for the Patreon platform and for my patrons. That doesn't mean, of course, I do not read some of your comments. I do. So by all means, keep commenting and I answer when I can. Uh, and as you can see, sometimes I even make videos out of questions. Uh, not just from my patrons on the Patreon platform, but from uh, comments as well on my YouTube videos. So, the question was this, and I, co I, I quote, uh, What about the Angraboda and the Loke eating her half-burned heart three times? Uh, where's that fit in another personality? As I said, this comment was uh, on the video about uh, the, about Gulveig, so by her heart, uh, the person means Gulveig, obviously. <laughs> uh, there is this idea circulating uh, for some time now concerning Loke eating the heart of Gulveig three times. Um, it's it's a very good good question actually uh, because. Um, which allows me to express and demystify some common misconceptions. So uh, let's start by fixing <laughs> something here before uh, jumping to the, the main subject of this video. Angraboda and Loke do not eat a heart together. And the heart was neither eaten three times nor burned three times. Let me explain. And I do hope you enjoy this video, please. There is only one source, one single source, speaking about Loke eating a heart. The heart of a nameless, unknown woman. And the source is Hindu Lyod, the only one. This account is actually very vague. Loke eats the half-cooked heart of an evil woman that he takes from the embers. He takes the heart from the embers. By eating the heart, it becomes pregnant and gives birth to monsters. No other explanation. However, these monsters are called flogged in Old Norse. For instance, uh, flogged kona, uh, which is one of the very, very negative and pejorative terms for witch woman. In other words, it's a highly derogatory term with an approximate meaning of witch with a range of very, very negative connotations that includes sexual license, whore, ugliness, stupidity, and outright evil. This term occurs with, with relative frequency in the, in the written sources, actually, about 39 times. So, what Loki gave birth to were witches, but not in the good sense of it at all. Some modern pagans took this as Loki giving birth to the Volur, to the Cyruses and the Prophetesses in Old Norse society. And as such, a contemporary idea was created that Loki was worshipped by the Volur, by the Prophetesses or the Cyruses or the Soothsayers, which isn't true at all. As I've stated in the video about Loki, which you can see right here, 
he was never actually a god, regarded as a god. He was never actually worshipped, as he was and still is to this day in traditional folklore, a vet, a spirit of the household and the hearth, and also the spirit of heat and weather. But also the representation of the trickster spirits found in traditional indigenous societies. The um, shaman cultural hero, the semi-divine figure. The fact that Loki gives birth to the flogged demonstrates a later religious conception and the um, denigrating image towards uh, witches, troll women, uh, women practitioners of magic and the sorceresses and prophetesses. So the, the, the account is not really giving a good image at all, but rather a Christianized conception of transporting the figure of Loki closer to the figure of the Christian devil as the progenitor of demons and monsters and evil women, witches. And as such, Loki is here in this account portrayed as the father of monsters, demons and evil women, witches, troll women, women practitioners of magic. The term flogged belongs to the later sources, written sources, composed precisely with the advent of Christianity. I would actually point out um, for the origins of this uh, account, Hindoliod, somewhere between the late 10th century and the 11th centuries. Um, flogged in, is precisely used in the sources when sorceresses had taken already um, a fairy tale quality uh, as evil witches. Flogged, among other terms, starts to be used as the reflection of the general fear, disquiet, and mistrust that the Volur, the prophetesses or the Syrises, and their kind aroused in the communities of Scandinavia when people started to progressively adopt Christian religious conceptions and the general fear of witchcraft and people practitioners of magic. Of course, the monsters in this account may also refer to Fenrir, Jormungandr, and Hel. But then again, from the 10th century onwards in Scandinavia, we already start to have depictions of Loki as the father of demons, progenitor of monsters, equating him with the figure of the devil, the Christian devil, as the father of demons, as was said before, of course. We are, of course, <laughs> we are also well aware of Loki's abilities uh, to shape shift and his gender fluidity, but this aspect in him remotes to a shamanic past uh, and the ability of the shaman to have a second life in the other world or, or the world of the spirits and being able to have spirit children. Uh, take a look at my video uh, concerning uh, sexuality, gender identity and spirit spouse in shamanism if you have the time of course. Just for a better understanding of what I'm saying in here of the shaman's second life and second family. So we don't have to repeat this all over again. And of course, the idea of wolves and snakes or serpents is very recurrent in Old Norse accounts uh, as the helping spirits of the sorcerers or the sorceresses, uh, which is also something quite notable within shamanism and the animal helping spirits of the shaman. If you have the time also, um, well, I do advise you again to watch my video on Loki, uh, which you can see right here in this right upper corner, in relation to his depiction as a spirit related to fire, as well as the image of the Sabi divine shaman, and of course uh, the video on helping spirits in Seder, where I have explored the case of animal and the tutelary spirits of the prophetesses in Old Norse uh, spirituality, in, in the Old Norse society, especially the helping spirits uh, in relation to wolves and snakes or serpents. Now, returning to the heart, it also belongs to an evil woman, but it isn't clear to which evil woman the heart belongs to. Because the monsters in this account in Hindulyod have been often interpreted as the great serpent Jormungandr, the wolf Fenrir, and the goddess of the underworld and the realm of the dead, Hel. 
as previously mentioned. And um, these three are also usually attributed to the union of Angra Boda and Loke. It has been assumed that the heart belonged to Angra Boda. One section of Hindu Lyot states that Loki gained the wolf, possibly Fenrir, gained the wolf by Angra Boda, which may imply that it was Loki actually impregnated by Angra Boda, and thus Fenrir was born. But further ahead, we shall see a different approach to this. It might not actually be the wolf Fenrir, but something else, a power. So, Loki ate her heart, consumed her power, to give birth to more monsters, to generate more power. But it isn't as simple as this, of course. The heart that Loki ate and uh, its origins should be considered before attributing uh, it to Angra Boda or jumping into any other conclusion. It came from an evil woman. Loki took it from the embers, and it was half-cooked. So, it must be taken into consideration the account within the Voluspa. Uh, I have presented in, in the video concerning uh, Gulveig, which mentions the Haysir and Vanir war, and uh, of course, the evil woman named Gulveig, which was sacrificed and was thrust with spears and burned by the Haysir, in Odin's hole three times. She was burned and reborn um, three times, but it wasn't enough to destroy her. She didn't die. This led to a contemporary fairy uh, tale or fantasy that the half-cooked heart of Gulveig remained, and so this was the one Loki ate. On the other hand, Angerboda's heart was said to be frozen like the sea spray. So some modern altars made a connection here. So the cold and hard heart of, of Angra Boda did not burn when the rest of the body did. So this makes Gulveig the same as Angra Boda, which just isn't true at all. This main idea comes actually from Victor Riedberg's Underschöpninge i Jormonisk Mythology published in 18, uh, 1886, also known as uh, Teutonic Mythology, as you know, uh, which for a very, very long time has become an obsolete source, completely useless by this point. Not all of it, but most of it. It needs to be revised, highly revised. Anyway, uh, which some people still strongly use today, unfortunately. And not co coincidentally, it's also one of the main sources, if not the main source, the author of the book, uh, Gulveig Arbok used to create his work, which is why it keeps on pointing uh, to the exact same misconceptions uh, proposed by Victor Riedberg. Uh, not to mention that the Gulveig Arbok is um, certainly a, a, a very interesting and unique perspective. I really enjoyed it. I found it extremely interesting and entertaining. However, as the author himself points um, in that book, he pointed out that it is his own religious perspective based on his own spiritual path, which is chaos gnosticism, anti-cosmic Satanism. And such philosophical, religious and esoteric approaches were, of course, inexistent in the pre-Christian Scandinavian pagan past, right? So, even though this source, we are talking about the Hindu Lyod, uh, speaking about Loki eating a heart, has a lot of Christian conceptions, there is no dispute, we shall see this further ahead, it also has pagan conceptions, so calm down. The poet of Hindu Lyod was, without a doubt, either a newly converted Christian or a pagan knowledgeable in Christian religious conceptions. But we have a problem here, the main problem we really must address, because the original Hindu Lyod did not survive. The written source Hindu Lyod is only preserved in its entirety in the Fletejarvok, 
which is a medieval Icelandic manuscript produced by the Christian priests and scribes, <laughs> uh, Jan uh, Thordason and Magnus Thordahalsson. We are talking about a work produced by the end of the 14th century in Iceland, so almost 400 years after Catholicism became the official religion in Iceland. So it's small wonder this account has so many Christian ideas and Christian conceptions and the general fear of witchcraft. Nevertheless, the idea of eating a heart is actually much older than this. There's no doubt that the idea of Loki producing evil women and the demons and monsters by eating the heart of, a, of, of an evil woman is a Christian theme. But the consumption of the heart alone is pagan. So let's explore that. Loki eating a heart bears close resemblance with the account in Fofnismal. In Fofnismal, it relates to how the hero Sigurd slays the great serpent or dragon Fafnir with the aid of Regin. As the serpent dies, or the dragon, Regin reveals secrets, answers questions, and gives counsel to Sigurd. The hero Sigurd comes back from the, the slaying of the, of the great dragon or the serpent. Apparently, he comes as a new man. When Regin tries to praise his warrior's deeds, and warrior's abilities and capacities, Sigurd replies that many men are courageous who never reddened their sword in another man's chest. So, Regin is anxious and fearful by Sigurd's new attitude, but still regarding Sigurd as his apprentice, orders him to roast the heart of Fafnir. Regin drinks Fafnir's blood and goes to sleep, while Sigurd works with the roasting. But as he is roasting the heart, a drop of blood falls uh, down on his finger, which Sigurd licks, and suddenly he can understand the speech of birds. He gains a new ability. The birds tell him that Regin will betray him and that he should take the gold of Fafnir. The serpent or the dragon was a very powerful religious symbol before Christianization, as you know it. It was a source of power, magical power. The serpent or the dragon who reveals knowledge about the other worlds, the other um, supernatural spheres, and uh, reveals about fate, prophecy. Well, it is obviously a powerful creature, and so is its blood and its own heart. Regin falls asleep after drinking the blood of the dragon or the serpent. And this is interesting because Regin, upon consuming, uh, uh, upon consuming the blood of the serpent, falls into a deep sleep, which is most likely in reference to a trance-like state. On the other hand, Sigurd licks the blood from the very heart of the great serpent, and thus he now possesses new abilities, new powers, magical powers. So Loki, most likely in an earlier account, probably from the oral tradition, lost to us, must have eaten the heart of a powerful animal, probably a serpent or a dragon, and gained tremendous power. And this shows the same initiation process found in the account Fafni Small, and the consumption of the heart by the initiate, by the beginner, by the apprentice. Now, with the advent of Christianity, this was changed, obviously. And so Loki instead ate the heart of an evil woman, a witch, the flogged, which is the most derogative term possible, and gave birth to the monsters, equating this with the Christian devil. This is a medieval Catholic imagery implying that the heart of witches is corrupted and even by eating it, consuming its essence, the person ends up sprouting demons, ends up possessed. Not in the literal sense of giving birth to demons, of course, but what is actually implied is the medieval Christian fear 
of witchcraft in general and sorcery and uh, the fear of the heathen practices which by christian medieval understanding and thinking in scandinavia the practices of the heathens opened up doors that could not be properly closed and that such demons and other entities would be unleashed and unleash havoc in the christian society and disrupt the religious order and peace this fear is very well present in the law books especially concerning the the practice of uti seta galrar gerningar and spalomar and this fear of doors left opened this is why Loke is portrayed as giving birth to evil women, troll women or witches, unleashing them after eating the heart of a witch in the sense of becoming corrupted by the very touch and the consumption of the essence of a witch or her heart and being possessed by demons. But originally, this points to an earlier account of the consumption of a heart as a form of initiation, possibly into some art concerning divination, prophecy, as it is also present within Fofnisma, because as soon as the hero Sigurd consumes the blood from the serpent's heart, and uh, quite possibly most likely also ate the heart, it is revealed to him Regin's intentions. It is given to, to Sigurd, to the hero Sigurd, prophecy, among other abilities and magical powers. So originally Loki ate the heart of a powerful animal, which is why he gained new powers, new abilities. It wasn't originally the heart of Gulveig, nor Angraboda for that matter, obviously, but probably a serpent. The serpent Jormungandr, the great world serpent, often associated precisely with Loki, as well as Angraboda and Hirokin, not as the same figures, but as figures representative of sorcery, magic, prophecy, and the serpent being the representation of the tool of the Volva, the prophetess or the Cirrus, which was the Gondor, a wand-like utensil phallic in shape, as well as the staff of the sorceress, a status symbol of the sorcerer or the sorceress. But for more information on such tools and utensils of the, of the prophetesses in Old Norse um, uh, society, please watch the video on Helping Spirits in Seder, as I've previously mentioned in here. Just click on this information icon in this uh, right upper corner, as well as the notes on the very video uh, of Gulveig. Please pay close attention to those um, as well, in the relation to this utensil of the Volvo. Now, Loki in here, in this account, is the representation of the soothsayer or the semi-shaman sorcerer, and eating a heart of an animal is present within shamanic performances. And let's not forget, as I've pointed out on the video <laughs> about Loki, as I said before, that Loki seems to have been originally understood, as, it's, as, it, as it is still present in folklore, as the spirit of the hearth. In the household. Uh, so it's curious this idea in the poem Hindu Lyod of Loke eating a half cooked heart he took from the embers. As the fire spirit he is, or at the very least uh, the domestic spirit residing in the hearth and somewhat related to fire, he consumes a heart from the embers, a heart which is an offering to the domestic spirit of the hearth. So in this account of Loki eating a half-cooked heart he took from the embers may be the representation of a sacrifice as an offering, giving the heart of an animal or maybe a human heart to the spirit of the hearth in order to receive something in return, some magical power or some prophecy. And Loki within Scandinavian folk traditions is said to be the spirit of the hearth to whom people give offerings to and receive wealth in return, receive something precious, an animistic symbiotic relationship. So he doesn't eat the heart, 
He is the spirit of the earth, which through fire consumed the offering and gives something in return. Probably in relation to divination, you know, prophecy, as we have the parallel of the hero Sigurd receiving divination and receiving um, other abilities and supernatural powers upon the consumption of Fafnir's blood and possibly the heart as well. In the account of Loke eating a heart, people usually try to concoct all manner of forced ideas to link this event or this account or th this idea, link it to Gurveig or Angra Boda and the art of Seder. But they usually forget the very, very important account of Eric's saga Rauda. If indeed people really want to make a connection in here between Loki and uh, the art of Seder, the performance of Seder, by eating a heart, or a connection between Loki and the Volur, the prophetesses or the Cirruses, we may find an answer in Eric's saga Rauda which states that to the sorceress, or the Volvo, or the soothsayer, Thorbjörg, it is given a special meal made of different animals' hearts. This is her last meal before her Seder performance the next day, before her divination or prophetic performance or ceremony. The specific and and the, the special request by Thorbjörg to eat different animals' hearts gives us an idea that she also draws some power from the hearts. Again, we have to take into consideration the animal spirits of the shaman, the animal guiding spirits, or even tutelary spirits. And in many traditional indigenous societies, especially of the circumpolar regions, Animals are often sacrificed by the shaman and the spirits of these animals will guide the shaman uh, in the specific task that must be performed. The consumption of the heart is to acquire the spirit, the essence and the power of the animal to which that heart belonged to. Thorbjörg also eats the hearts to be able to acquire the help of the animal spirits. If you have the time, <laughs> please also take a look at my video concerning um, helping spirits in shamanism, right? Now, Loki, Thorbjörg, and the hero Sigurdr present this parallel of the consumption of hearts and acquiring special abilities. Uh, special powers and magical powers, and even divination, receiving prophecy. And this is in extremely interesting, at least to me, <laughs> because this idea of the heart containing the power, the spirit, vital force, essence, and magic or magical power, remotes back to the Paleolithic. Before the last glacial period, the great majority of the human populations, not all of them, but the great majority, resided in Western Iberian Peninsula. Uh, nowadays, Portugal and parts of Spain. And one of the best complex of artistic representations of the Paleolithic are found precisely in Val do Coa, in Portugal. Coa Valley. Representations of animals, mostly horses, bulls, elk, and all, all manner of cervids, but the most astonishing aspect about these artistic representations, animal representations on rock art, are the so-called lifelines. Each of these Paleolithic animal representations on, on rock art also have the representations of lines passing inside the animal's bodies. Lines that usually go or start uh, from the mouth uh, and I'll go all the way to the sexual organ, but always converging to the heart. These lifelines draw a picture of the life, power and, and essence and vitality of the animal, from mouth, entering of the spirit, passing through the heart and going to the very symbol that propitiates more life, the sexual organ, uh, sexual fertility aspects. But each line passes through the heart, and all lines converge to the heart. 
And uh, as the Paleolithic Iberian art um, uh, progressively develops, we start to see more lines, these lifelines, converging to the heart, like a web or a nucleus that links every line of life, giving a great emphasis to the center of the animal, uh, where the heart resides, as the source of spirit and, and essence and power and vitality of the animal. This is very important because this type of art is also found in prehistoric Scandinavia, mostly in Western Scandinavia. In fact, the Western Iberian Paleolithic art influenced Scandinavian prehistoric rock art in Western Scandinavia. Because these Western Iberian Paleolithic human communities eventually migrated north into Scandinavia after the last glacial period, uh, when the ice started to melt in the south. And uh, so some human communities, not all of them obviously, but some of them, followed the reindeer due north and settled in Scandinavia eventually. And we start to see this type of art, uh, rock art, uh, in Scandinavia precisely in the period following the melting of the ice of the last glacial period, obviously, uh, during the Epipaleolithic, to be more precise, or also known as Mesolithic, as you know it. Representations of animals with a lifeline from mouth to sex, often passing through the heart, to the center of the, the animal's, animal's body. The Iberian Paleolithic art, giving a great emphasis to the head of the animal, as the representation of the identity of the animal and probably maybe where the spirit resided, and then the lifelines converging to the center of the animal, where the heart resides, right? There are many prehistoric similarities, actually, between uh, Western Iberia and Western Norway, Western Scandinavia, where it is nowadays Norway. There are many evidences of shared thoughts and related ideologies between Western, uh, what is now Western Norway, and the Iberian Peninsula. The sedentary hunter-fisherman of Western Norway shared a number of related religious conceptions and ideologies and ideas with sedentary hunter-fisher farmers further south among the, uh, along, along the uh, Atlantic coast in the Iberian Peninsula, where it is nowadays Portugal and parts of northern Spain, Galicia. This may also have included the ideology behind the related cup and ring traditions of Brittany and the British Isles, thereby connecting the um, northern tradition in what is now western Norway, connecting it to the Atlantic tradition. In fact, most researchers by now have argued that the appearance of spirals and concentric circles in Western Scandinavia was a result of influences from Southern Europe and the extreme Western Atlantic art, rock art. I'm taking into consideration and into account the new dating evidences from recent excavations and recent studies which indicate that the rock art in Western Scandinavia, where it is nowadays Norway, and the representations of animals and spirals was produced in the late Mesolithic. And a number of recent studies of the British and the Iberian rock art show that this was an influence progressively from south to north and back along the Atlantic. It seems at least plausible to consider that these ideas may have spread from an opposite point of origin, obviously. Cultural exchanges in interaction, always. Since Scandinavia seems to have a much longer, Western Scandinavia, a much longer tradition of creating rock art at open air sites than other Scandinavian countries, just like the Western prehistoric Iberian peoples and the religious or ideological practices. Uh, of, of, of depicting images in rock may have indeed been adopted from cultures further south during the process of contact between groups in uh, northern and 
Southern Europe since the last glacial period. And obviously the, the migrations, loads of migrations from the extreme western south along the Atlantic, following the reindeer due north into Scandinavia. In in, in prehistory, there was already um, a great emphasis on the idea of the heart containing the spirit and the essence and the, and the power and the vitality of the animal, as you can see, and as I've explained. Uh, and thus, it was eaten, the heart was eaten to acquire the power of the animal and the, 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 the vitality and the spirit. Just as the same way Törbjörg, in the account of Erik Sagarauda, ate the hearts of several animals, and the hero Sigurd drank the blood from the heart of the great serpent, and a very powerful religious symbol. And most likely he also ate the roasted heart in some oral tradition lost to us by now, which was meant, the heart was actually meant for Regin to acquire the secret wisdom of the serpent. And finally, Loke, most likely in an earlier account, also ate the heart of an animal, probably the serpent or a wolf's heart, as it is also stated in Hindu Yod that Loke gained the wolf from Angraboda, which might be a reference to the um, sacrifice of a wolf and eating its heart to acquire its power as the wolf in Scandinavia is also the animal symbol often related to magic and sorcery and prophecy, the animal spirit of the prophetess or the seeress, the volu. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thank you for today.